morning. All right, well, this is adult ed, which means it is not Sunday school. We don't deal with fluff here, so don't be afraid to stop me. Nicholas, don't be embarrassed because you're the youngest here. If you, I want to speak to you. So don't be afraid because I want you to understand what we're talking about. This is, this is, this is the real stuff, I believe. Um, I find it myself, I find it uh, inspiring. It's what uh, gives me joy. Um, So don't be afraid to stop me and ask questions, even if you feel that they're um, stupid, um, within reason. So we have been talking all summer about uh, erotic desire and gender, and we did not finish. We're not done with that. Um, So we'll continue, but we have uh, some of you here who have not been here with us all the summer. so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, re- review a bit, uh, for those of you who have been here, um, even though the re- it may be a review, it may not be a bad thing, because as I said, this is not, um, this is not uh, easy, easy stuff, and I don't know that you are able to, to absorb it all in the first pass. It, it doesn't hurt to review it and to, uh, and to get it um, uh, grounded in your, in your mind. So, um, where we're going to start today is at the beginning. Start at the beginning in an effort to understand the mystery of gender. That's what we're talking about specifically. The mystery of gender. Man and woman. Male and female. What is the church's vision of, uh, of gender? Um, a, a, a question that has become all the more intense over the last, um, what, uh, 30 years or so? 30, 40 years? Um, um, And so there's not been like an articulated, I mean, there have been many uh, efforts to address the question uh, in a theological, in an orthodox theological way. Um, Personally, I think perhaps the best might be by Father Thomas Hopko in his book on, what is it, uh, Orthodoxy and Same-Sex Attraction or something like that, which is a basically a compendium on, whole ortho, on all of Orthodox theology. Um, but even though, so, even, so, so what, I'm, what I'm doing, all of a, anyone now, anyone these days who, um, who endeavors to speak to this topic is something of a pioneer. Um, Having said that, however, let's not, under, let's not uh, get the impression that the church has had, has had nothing to say. The fact is that, that the church has been speaking to this um, from the beginning. And it's just really a matter of, um, of le- learning to listen to what the church has been saying. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, learning how to, uh, to think uh, while praying. So having said that as a, by way of an introduction, uh, do they want to be in their class, Zanita, at all? Do they want to be with you, or do they want to go to their class? Oh, where's the class? Uh, let's see. Are they with Brad? Go upstairs and into the nave <laughs> and uh, find my wife. She might be in the balcony by now with her class. I think okay. Ask, ask Presbytera who their, who their class is. Okay, so, um, so it's a matter of learning to listen to what, what the Bible is saying and what the church is saying. Um, and honestly, over the summer, as I have been um, you know, thinking on this and pondering it, uh, uh, I'm uh, especially at, at vigil, um, when we're singing all of these prayers and all of these verses, I'm, 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 uh, I'm um, bowled over by how, how much um, is contained in the, in the prayers of the church that speak to the issue of man and woman. It's a profound vision. It's a beautiful vision. And my hope is to convey that to you um, so that you also catch 
how beautiful it is. So um, we'll start looking at this topic now uh, by going to the beginning. And I'm going to start with um, an ancient uh, philosopher who was kind of in between, uh, the tr he was in the transition from uh, 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 the mythology to philosophy. So we're, I can't even remember what his dates were. Hesiod, do you remember? Fourth century BC? Hesiod? You think Hesiod? Was he about fourth century BC? Um, but was he before Plato, Aristotle? I can't remember. Okay, all right, all right. So he wrote this poem. He wrote several things, but he wrote this poem. And, he, and it's entitled The Theogony. And this title is going to become even more interesting when we uh, unfold, um, when we start looking at it in the light of the church. Theo means what? God. 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 Do you know what goni stands for? Is it, is it similar in etymological root to agony? No, I don't think so. It means um, coming to be. Um, so I think, it, I think it might be from Gignomai. So you have cosmology, which is the doctrine of the world, the doctrine of the world, and you have cosmogony, which is how the world came to be. So this is a theogony. So, <laughs> you know, what does the title mean? It would seem to mean how the gods came to be. How the gods came to be. The beginning of the gods. And so, um, uh, all right, damn, that's very fascinating. Um, and, 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 and this, you know, Tim, you tell me if I'm wrong, but th this is not, uh, this is not um, out of sync with, with the whole of ancient thought. I mean, the gods are, uh, they themselves kind of uh, have a beginning. And this comes into expression when, the, when, he, when Hesiod begins his theogony with the word, with the phrase, chaos, or was first. Chaos was first. Now the reason this is important is because the beginning, especially in <coughs> mythology, is the same as the end. So the beginning determines the end. Now let's 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 explore that. Chaos. What is chaos? You say what chaos is. Disorder, yes. Um, for our purposes, let's call it this. Undifferentiated unity. Everything's a jumble. It's a mess. There's no order. Disorder. Um, but everything's together. Okay? Everything's together. So from this primordial soup where everything is jumbling together, nothing's distinguishable from anything else, from out of that jumble come, come first the gods, <coughs> and then from the gods comes, they, they, they make the world or they fashion the world in some way, and all of the things. So, at the, so what is this saying? That beneath, beneath the order, beneath the law, uh, which is which is the which is uh, which is harmony um, and order? Um, there's something else. So law is not first. Order is not first. It's not the primordial beginning. Chaos is the primordial beginning. Um, at the beginning of all creation, the beginning of all of every particular. Um, every particular, particular, particular thing is grounded in an, uh, this undifferentiated unity, uh, this chaos. Okay, so the world comes into being. Um, when it comes into being, it, it, you, 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 chaos, I mean, can you imagine chaos existing? I mean, can you, can you imagine, or not like that, can you imagine chaos 
having any kind of shape or form. Um, it's, I, mean, I can't. Can you? So if chaos is going to come into existence, if it's going to have, you know, become, let's say, uh, material, if it's going to become visible, if it's going to, um, it's, it's going to have to take a shape, it's going to have to take form. So um, this undifferentiated unity is going to uh, come into being uh, in some way, and so it's, it's, it's perhaps significant that in all of the in all of ancient thought, mytholo mythological, philosophical, whatever, all of ancient thought, the creation comes into being in two primary poles, and that's heaven and earth. That's which is the male, the female. Um, which one is yin? So you will be earth. Okay, so this is yang. And this is yin. So that the um, the beginning of all things is yin yang. Uh, heaven and earth, male and female. But the beginning of the beginning is chaos. If the beginning has a beginning, then are you with me? The beginning has the beginning, then when the beginning, um, how would you say, reverts back to its, its primordial, um, absolute beginning, where is it going to go? Chaos. Chaos. So, heaven and earth, male, female, which, are the, which is the fundamental structure of all creation. Where is that going to go? When let's say it this way, what is at the root of the male? What's at the root of the female? Chaos. Chaos. So at their absolute origin, male, female are undifferentiated. You got that? They're chaotic, and they're they're they're. they're they are undifferentiated. They dissolve. So male is destined, as it were, when the world comes to an end, um, in the great in the great year, however many years that is. Uh, Twenty five thousand is that what it is? Whatever. Uh, when the male, when when the world comes to an end, and everything reverts, everything reverts back to its original. Um, I don't want to say form its original existence, is everything's going to revert back to chaos. The male and the female, heaven and earth, yin-yang, are going to dissolve back into this undifferentiated unity. Okay? That's the mythological vision. And from what I can observe, um, that's human thought has not advanced beyond that. You realize that in the history of, 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 uh, intel of, uh, of uh, human thought, you, you start with mythology. Mythology gives birth to philosophy. Philosophy gives birth to science um, and to history. Uh, history is a, is a department of science. So even scientific learning, scientific, you know, the scientific enterprise, it's, its mother is philosophy, its grandma is mythology. Yes, Matthew? Well, I mean, you can even see this in things like particle physics and astrophysics, where they, the further back that they can see, mm -hmm. um, everything just becomes kind of background radiation. So the background kinda... radiation is undifferentiated. Okay. You can't tell anything. Yeah. Uh, you can't make out any sort of discrete phenomena. Yes, yes. So yes, that's, that, that illustrates the point that I'm making, that even today, with our advances in scientific understanding, we have not advanced beyond this fundamental view of the world. That at the primordial beginning is chaos, undifferentiated unity. Okay, so when um, a, 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 a young man or young woman um, in today's um, society that has no, that has lost its, um, that has lost its baptism, 
Um, and they, they decide they don't, the man doesn't like to be a man. He wants to become a woman. Um, philosophically, theor um, um, what's, why not? You see? Why not? Um, what am I anyway? What is my maleness anyway? What is my femaleness anyway? Why don't I just become a woman? Why does the woman just become a man? And we have the technology, now we can do that. So why not? Because fundamentally, what am I? Chaos. Chaos. <laughs> so um, that illustrates uh, the, the climate uh, that we are in, that the church, this, this, so, you know, honestly, uh, the church comes, uh, the, the, the image of the church as the ark, uh, sailing uh, the sea of death, you know, protected from the winds and the waves uh, by the wood of the cross, which forms the ark, uh, that, that image becomes all the more, you know, um, um, powerful. Um, and in the ark, in the ark, it's a completely different reality. Um, so in the church, we live, if you will, in a different place than the rest of the world. We're governed by a different vision, um, a different understanding of who we are. And uh, let's, let's look at that different understanding right now. And as we did with uh, here in uh, mythology, which is the grandmother of all human thought, let's go even beyond mythology. And let's go to theology. I mean, real theology. This is not the theology that you get by reading books and getting a degree <coughs> and writing a 250-page thesis, and now I'm called a theologian. This is the theology. This is how I interpret this, how I translate it. God, again, Logi, comes from the Logos, but who's the Logos? Christ. Christ. He is the, and, and, and in Hebrew, logos is the bar, which can be translated as word. The, the bar in Hebrew means what is at the back. What's at the back? And uh, so um, it's, it's the back field, it's the, you know, it's, uh, when it had, when in its religious connotation, it means what's at the back of the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the gate that opens onto the beyond. But the beyond that the sanctuary opens onto is not chaos. What is it? Kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. We could be more specific. The Holy Trinity. So it opens onto the beyond. It opens onto God as Holy Trinity. So theology. As I, as, I would, as I would translate it, theology is a vision of the world from the, from the logos. In other words, from the back of the sanctuary. In other words, from the gate that opens onto heaven, onto God. And so theology is looking at the world from the perspective of who? 
of Christ or of God. Okay? You have any college students here? You just graduated high school. What if you had said this to your high school teachers? They would have probably sent me down to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, this is awfully presumptuous. <coughs> this is awfully presumptuous. Unless it's true. Yes, but Christ exists. <laughs> it's awfully presumptuous unless Christ exists as God. Yes, yes. But now, if this is the vision of the world from the perspective of God, how am I going to get that vision? How am I going to hear the, you know, how am I going to, yeah, revelation, yeah, but how am I going to receive the revelation? I mean, you're right, but. Do you mean before you know God or after you know God? Even whether, what, even before. How am I going to, how am I going to, what I'm after is, you know, perhaps one of the, perhaps the, 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 the primary verb of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel. Hear, Listen. And did you know that the word in Greek for obedience is formed from the word to hear? So the way I'm going to get this vision of the world, the way I'm going to get this theology is by listening. And who am I listening to? Who am I trying to listen to? I'm trying to listen to God. I'm trying to listen to the Word of God. What does that mean that I have to do with my ideas? Silence my thought. Them. What's that? Silence them. Put them to yes. Yeah, silence them. Put them to death. Put to death all that's earthly in you. That includes your own thoughts that come not from God, but from you, from the soil of your own body. So this means prayer. And in the church. You know, in the services of the church, this is where we hear the words of God. I was just telling you, that over the summer, as I've been pondering this whole issue, um, I have been listening at vigil. I mean, vigil especially is where all the words of the church come together and, and present to us the theology of, of, of the church. I've been, I've been bowled over by how profoundly the uh, prayers of the church speak to this issue. And so many of my insights have come at vigil. Just listening, trying to listen uh, to what I'm hearing. Um, so it's, it's so we, through prayer uh, is how we listen to hear the, the voice of God, the word of God that is speaking to us from the back, from the gate that opens onto heaven. And so this is what we want to uh, look at right now. The theological, not the mythological vision, but the theological vision of, of the world. Um, I made this point also over the summer. I want to make it again, because it's a point that, that really um, is powerful to me. Um, um, I do not uh, disdain mythology. Um, I hold mythology in, in, in high regard uh, because I see mythology as the, um, as, as, as the song of the soul. Um, the soul is singing in mythology. Um, and in the song of mythology, the soul is expressing what she knows deep down, beyond, beyond the mind. We tend to think of mythology as a collection of fables and fairy tales. Um, that's not mythology. Um, mythology is how um, the ancient world used to express you used to express um, truth as 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 the as the world understood it. Um, for example, uh, in the uh, in the hymn of Parmenides, um, one of the pre-Socratics. Um, the, the goddess comes to Parmenides. She's going to tell him. Um, she's going to reveal to him um, the mystery of the cosmos. And what she says to him is, listen to my myth. This is my myth. And I think it's Plato in, uh, which is the one where he's dying? Is it where he's facing his... No, 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 no. 
Uh, it's not the Phaedrus, is it? Where he, the Phaedrus. Phaedrus, where he's, where, he's, where he's on his deathbed, just before he's going to drink the hemlock. Um, it, when he, you know, his disciples are gathered around him, and they're all in distress because he's about to drink the hemlock and die, uh, and, you know, fulfilling the sentence of death that was passed upon him. And so in their distress, he's trying to comfort them, so they start, they, 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 he's going to talk to them about the, uh, about the, the afterlife. You know, what, what's going on, what, what happens when the soul dies, when the body dies. And in the opening paragraph, what he says, um, what he says and, I, and I think that, that whoever is writing this, um, probably Plato, when he's writing this, I think he's, he's doing it intentionally. I think he means something by it. He says, so, Socrates uh, rose from his bed he, and he put his feet on the ground. Well, you know, foot on the ground. That means his head's not in the clouds, right? His feet were on the ground. And then he says to his disciples, okay, let's mythologize. Let's mythologize. Um, the myth expresses the mystery that is beyond my birth and my death. It's what the soul knows. And so I feel that uh, in mytho that mythology is like uh, the light that emanates from the stars. Scientists can study the light, and from the light they can track the history of the universe and even the, the structure of the universe. Mythology is the same way. It's the light that emanates from the soul depths. And by studying mythology, we can get a, a picture of how the soul is configured how the soul moves. Um, so in this, in this light, it's, it's fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating, to see how mythology, and as far as I know, I mean, I've not read all the myths, obviously, but from what I have read so far, it's fascinating to me to see how in all of the myths, in one form or another, it seems that they all take you back to this undifferentiated unity, chaos. And what I make of that is that here is the evidence of the fall. Because you remember, Eden is a mountain. And halfway up is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And its boughs stretched all the way across so that Adam and Eve could not see at the top of the mountain where it was the tree of life. And you remember that Adam and Eve never made it up to the tree of life. They never made it up to theology. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree is the goddess or the earth or the, or the feminine principle and the serpent hanging from the tree is the god, the male principle. So you have you have heaven and earth, male, female, is the serpent. And what's the wisdom of the serpent that Adam and Eve eat and drink when they take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's the wisdom of the myth. In other words, mythology goes far as, can only go as far back as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what I'm saying. Mythology takes you back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It does not see beyond the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Its eyes have been closed. Um, it's blind. It's deaf. So when we, when we presume to give the theological vision of the world, we are presuming... Um, no, we're not presuming. We are, we are, um, we are daring uh, to say that from the church we hear the word of the tree of life uh, which is the father of the myth. The myth is blind because it has closed in on itself by, by, by treating itself, the serpent and the goddess, as the, as the god and the goddess, if you will. Um, but theology is is, is, is the God who is the author and the creator of all things. So with theology, 
we are we are going past the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we're we're making our way to the tree of life to hear what is the theological vision of reality and we start why not with Genesis 1 1 or we can start with John 1 1 there are other places in the scripture that also speak of the creation but these are the these are the obvious um, what do we read in Genesis 1 1 you don't have to have your Bibles you know what it says what does it say in the beginning This is Genesis, and how does it continue? No? <laughs> well, we'll do that one then now, Nick. In the beginning, or at the back of the sanctuary, was the Word, the Logos, the Dabar. What does it say in Genesis? In the beginning, God created. God created. <coughs> The heavens, or male, the male principle, and earth, the female principle. Yes, Matthew? So, at least in the, I don't know, I don't know about the Hebrew, but at least in the Greek translation of, of Genesis, right, the, the created verb, that, is that verb poesis? Yes, yes. So he's speaking, he's making a poem. Yes, yes, he's creating a poem. The heavens and earth are a poem, um, but yeah, but um, but you, the, the speaking comes later, of course. And, this, and then it goes on and says, "And God said, let there be, and there was." Yeah. So God, so let's keep going there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, um, and uh, the earth was without form and without void. Okay. So there's there's a picture of what the myth might call chaos. The earth was without form. It was unfurnished in the Greek. Um, um, it, ha it, it was, I don't know how to translate the Greek here. It, like, it, was, it was unsightly, or, or does it mean that it had no, it had no shape? Um, but let's, let's, let's go ahead and call that chaos. It looked like chaos. Um, but now think about that. So we have in the beginning in Genesis, as it's given, so we have we have what looks like chaos. I don't know if it's proper to call it chaos, but we'll call it chaos just for the sake of, of what we're doing here. Uh, which is uh, the earth was without form, and it was void or empty. This is the mythological formula. Of, of, uh, anyway, I mean, in so many of the myths, you say in the beginning when there was not this, there was not this, there was not that. <coughs> this was not yet. <coughs> so this is a very much. This very much echoes the mythological formula. So we see chaos, but is chaos the absolute beginning that we see? No, no, it's absolutely not. What is? God. God. God is at the beginning. So in, in, in the theological vision, God is the absolute beginning. Now we go to John. Now we go to John. And uh, John is actually taking us into God. Genesis just shows us God. John is taking us into God. And we're allowed to see into the darkness. You know, we say that God is dark not because he's dark, but because he is so incomprehensible that the mind cannot, cannot penetrate him. So there's the darkness of God, which is, a, which is a darkness that is caused by an excess of light that is beyond our ability to understand. So in John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the Dabar. And then how does it go on? The Word was with God. Now, we've said before, we've pointed out, that in the Greek, it's that you have God with a definite article there. So it literally was with the God. And uh, generally, in the New Testament, when you see that construction, we translate it as the Father. It's talking about the God who begot the Son. So it's the Father. The Word was with the Father. Um, 
And the word was, and then it goes on to say, the word was God. Now there's no definite article. Um, so John is expressing in biblical language what the church will find it necessary to um, articulate in more philosophically precise language in order to prevent um, heresy. Um, so in the terms of later, uh, uh, the later history of, of church dogma, the word was with the Father. Here we are on the level or in the, yeah, of, the, of the persons. So here's the person of the word who was with the person of the Father. And the word was God. Now when we do not have the definite article, we're talking about the essence of God. The essence is a philosophical word that refers to what, refers to the what, if you will, that makes everything to be what it is. And so you have a human essence, which all humans share. The human essence is what makes you to be human and not a dog. Um, so the essence is what's common to all the to talk in Aristotelian language to talk, is, is what is what is common to all the, in, the the individuals of the class in that particular class that species that genus. Um, so we have already we have a, a, an insight into the Trinity <coughs> as persons and one essence. Now, no, it keeps going. Um, the Word was with the Father, and the Word was God. All things came to be through Him. And there's not even one thing that came to be apart from Him. And then what does it say? Do you remember? In Him was life. In Him was life. Well, who, well, who was the life? The Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say, and the life was the light of men. He was the true light coming into the world. Um, so we have in John's opening four verses, he's taking us into the God who created the heavens and the earth. And we see that this God who created the heavens and the earth is not just... Um, He's not just, he's one. He's one in essence. There's not three gods. He's one in essence. But we also see that God is a, he's not an undifferentiated unity like chaos is. Rather, he is a differentiated unity. And that makes all the difference in the world for our understanding of how the world is put together. So we call, these, we call this differentiated unity in God. Um, the differentiated refers to the persons. And there are three of them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call these, in technically, and I'm saying this because if you come to Vigil, you'll hear this word a lot. And I'm pleased that our translation does not try to tra does not translate it into persons. You'll hear this word hypostasis or hypostases. The, plural, the singular is hypostasis, the plural is, is as hypostases. And it means, in Greek, it means that which stands underneath. So what we see in the Holy Trinity are three hypostases. These are that in which heaven and earth were created. So that heaven and earth does not come into being out of an undifferentiated unity. 
heaven and earth comes into being, come into being out of a differentiated unity. Or let's say out of a personal reality. And if you can bear it, a hypostatic reality. Okay, Matthew? So is the undifferentiated unity what the world can see standing in front of the veil that, that's dividing us from the altar? And right. then you're seeing out the back, then you start to see the differentiated unity. Okay. Is, is that... I mean, in, in the, yeah, as far as that goes, um, in, in terms of what you're trying to say, yes. Um, St. Gregory of Nyssa and in giving his uh, vision of God he says I, 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 I look at the three and I see I look at three lights and I see one light I look at the one light and I three, see three lights three and one um, and, and the three lights even as they're one do not dissolve into the other. And that's critically important. And don't worry if you can't fathom that, if you can't wrap your mind around it. Um, if you can wrap your mind around it, then you're not understanding it. But so, Okay, so the world has as its ultimate <coughs> origin this differentiated unity, which is a personal mystery. A mystery of three persons who in their essence are one but do not dissolve into each other. Now there's two points I want to go to. I've got to go, go real quick here. Let's give these philosophical terms which are very abstract. Let's give them another name that might make them more accessible to us. And let's call instead of saying the divine essence, well, let's again, let's use biblical language. And I think it's 1 John, I never can remember what it is. I think it's 1 John 4, 6, where St. John, if you will, gives to us the essence of God. And what does he say the essence of God is? God is love. So let's say that the essence is love. What then does that make the persons or the hypostases that stand underneath the, the love to be? It makes each one of them to be a lover who is beloved. Now, let's real quickly move on to the second point, then we'll, come, then we'll bring the two together. He said we have three hypostases, three standings underneath. You cannot have three standings underneath <laughs> all at once. Only one can be standing underneath. So who stands underneath everything? The Father. The Father. So the ultimate, absolute, ultimate beginning of all things is not some, you know, uh, undifferentiated soup but rather the, you know, the, the, the specific person of the Father. We say that he is the cause of the Trinity because the Son is begotten of him and the Holy Spirit proceeds from him. But as we make clear, this is not a, uh, a coming forth from the Father in time. There was never a time when the Son was not. The Son is eternally begotten from the Father. The Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. We have no way of describing this. We're trying to describe a reality that is beyond the human mind's ability to speak or to comprehend. So we, you know, we, so our language kind of tends to uh, maybe sound like uh, so much nonsense, the foolishness of the cross. But here's a point that I want to, to draw from all of this, that um, the reason this is critical that the Father is the cause of all things is because it shows that reality ultimately is personal, to use a term that we know. Um, but, in our, but, but we understand a person, you know, from, from, what we, from, what, from uh, looking at the Holy Trinity, we understand that a person is a lover who was beloved. 
so that the ultimate, the ultimate beginning uh, from which everything proceeds and, what, and, and this beginning that will determine the way that it's structured, the way that it mo the creation moves, and that will determine even how it's going to end, the absolute beginning of all things is the lover who is the father. But there cannot be a lover without a beloved, right? There cannot be a beloved without a, without a lover. So if the lovers, the beloved of the Son and the Holy Spirit were ever to dissolve in the Father, could you say that love abides forever? Absolutely not. But love does abide forever. Because Son never dissolves into the Father. The Holy Spirit never dissolves into the Father or into the Son. They are always three in one. One in three. So what does that mean? It means that the absolute beginning of creation what stands at the bottom of absolutely everything that determines the way it moves, the way it's shaped, and determines how it's going to end, is love. Love. The love of God. And that is at the beginning of everything. So male and female, obviously, as well the whole creation, come into being, not as just some kind of kaleidoscopic you know, configuration of atoms and uh, particles or whatever. But male and female, the whole of creation, comes into being in this hypostatic, personal mystery of divine love. So that means that creation, and each particular in the creation, every man, woman, and child, every plant of the field, bird of the sky, so forth and so on, comes into being with this invisible, divine, how would you say, uh, shape that determines how we move, it determines how we are, uh, what our end will be, it determines our nature and destiny. And that invisible shape is the love of God, or the hypostatic mystery, the loving mystery of God. Uh, so that creation is an embodiment, it's a coming into being, it's an expression, it's a manifestation of the hypostatic God, who is love, who is lover and beloved, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> so we'll have to think about that, because we've got to get upstairs and, uh, and, and, and enter into this mystery of divine love. Yes, questions, observations, comments? All right, we'll proceed from here. <laughs>